This is what we are. We are alive. So, I want to start by asking a question. How many of you think we're going to be cyborgs or we're going to merge with machines and computers? And how do you feel okay with it? How many of you in the room? Yeah, that's, uh, that's good. I thought we had more futurist work to do here, but it's, yeah, it's all good. So, um, I'm going to talk about an overall view of whatever I think in the last two days everyone talked about, and well, Nathan just finished talking about um, how all of these things, utopian, dystopian, there are always two sides of the story, but I'm putting it in, in, in the future that I believe happens now. I think um, the future that we think it's going to be like this or that, it's not gonna probably be uh, exactly what we think. So um, I think I'm one of those people who uh, don't believe in utopian or dystopian ideas as much because I think a predetermined uh, view of the future is actually not going to help us um, work on the future in, in practice as much. So, yeah, um, I'm also one of those people who uh, started learning uh, music and playing music and working with computers in a really, really primitive way. So when I was a kid, I kind of looked like this. Um, and when, I remember when, when I was young, um, me and my brother had this computer, a Commodore 64, and um, we just used to look at this device, this thing, which looked like this. How many of you remember this? Oh, amazing. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah, and I remember we, we just used to like touch this thing and so like there was no manual for it. I was, we grew up in Iran and uh, we just looked at this thing that didn't have any manuals, just a keyboard and a, so yeah, we, we used it in a very primitive way um, in a sense that we experimented with it. And uh, also this is not a nostalgic note. These devices are horrible, just like they don't work. Um, and yeah, we started playing around with it, uh, and we started asking questions, like, what does it mean to have an image on the screen of this thing? What does it mean to have a picture of the scenery? How, how can we make sense of this and, and communicate as kids, uh, aesthetically communicate with it? And we, we started realizing that there's a mechanics to the digital image on the monitors, on the terminals of these computers, and and we found out that pixels generate images and without, without uh, any, any other external knowledge, uh, only by using the device, we understood that there are pixels exist. So in, back in the day, in those images, there were these tiny boxes and you, you could create spaces with them. And finally, we, um, we could actually replicate sceneries, like real scenery that we thought it's real, but it was like really crappy. Um, so years later, for me, what, what it was missing, what there was missing was sound, generally because I liked music as a kid. I, I really wanted to learn how to play a melody, but with, uh, with something other than my voice. I wanted to like make something sound like a piece of music. And we discovered more. We discovered, we experimented more. We discovered that, um, these computers also have error sounds, like blips, like blip. And we put them in a pattern, in a rhythmic pattern, and they started um, sounding like melodies over time, actually, not in like two days or anything, over a year. And um, later, when I was in high school, um, I realized what this is, is that these devices that we used, even very primitive, very basic, they were, um, they were extending our cognition. They were helping us learn more, to be curious, and, and to understand more. So I started this whole thing since then. I, I, I've, I've been thinking about um, how our cognition is generally extended by uh, external devices. And um, so um, we, us humans, we have the need for cognition. There's no question about that. We, 
we want to learn. We're curious. If, if you leave us in a, in a space, we, we question, oh, how this sofa looks so nice, or how these objects are placed. We start to learn about things. And um, there is a five-factor model, uh, five factor model in psychology that I've been interested in. And one of those are openness to ex uh, experience. And um, these are really important factors to understand how our uh, digital uh, technologies work now. And first, active imagination, um, me doing audio and visual work, um, we, f we fa uh, fantasize a lot during our daytime, uh, when we work, when we are on the street, we fantasize, we imagine scenarios. Yeah, we were, in a, we we're in a car, I don't know how many of you have experienced when you're in a car, this is super bleak, sorry, but they, you, you suddenly um, it, fantasize a situation of a car accident, even, even though you're not going to be in, in one. You just see things, you, you create um, scenarios of being at work, maybe having a conversation with someone, it doesn't happen, but you fantasize. And that is our active imagination. We can't stop it. So, um, second one, aesthetic sensi sensitivity. Sorry, I missed that one. Um, we, we react and generate impressions using sentiment and taste. This is very important because uh, more and more that we have products that are relying on, on visual definitions, um, we also have very active sentiment and taste to choose things. If I see a car, I generate a pattern of reactions to, to how it looks based on how my taste is developed over years. So uh, also the rest, attentiveness to inner feelings. We, we reflect, we uh, go deep in our feelings like how we felt about something and we, we analyze it. And also we have preference for variety. I, I don't see many people who, um, who do one thing in, in any subject. Like they, we, we choose different things throughout our lives. When we go through a period of time in high school, we have different preferences. We have different choices. And at last, intellectual curiosity, which is very important in the, um, age, in the internet age. Um, all of these, in my opinion, makes us very curious beings. And um, it makes us open to experimentation and discovery. No one's pushing us really to, to go um, into science or ask more. We're just curious. This is, this is something that we have, and it's beautiful about us, us human beings. So what I asked, I became an artist. So I started becoming a musician, um, working still with computers. Um, I started asking myself, what is missing there? Adding visuals, maybe? Making music videos? What, what is missing from me being stimulated fully from music and sound? Um, so, I, so I came up with a method. Um, I thought this could be an interesting thing years back when virtual reality actually was in, in really uh, vague status. It, it was something that in the 90s people thought it might work, it might not work, it belongs to um, specific gaming um, um, situations where, where you go actually to a place and experience just one game and get out, which wasn't cool actually. Until recently where the devices improved um, and uh, hardware and software improved and you, you could actually do it at home and create experiences. So um, I concluded that Okay, I, what I need really is a multi-sensory um, virtual experience. And what, does, what that means for me was um, starting with breaking down what music is, what specifically electronic music, when you use computers to make music, when you create sound objects that are data in computers. So I started to um, experiment with sound objects in computers with my friend. And it, the, the result was really interesting. We, we decided that mu music, musical pieces, are environments. And we can create those environments now using virtual reality. So mixing these two was um, really interesting. You, you remember the Windows M Media Player visualizers. This was basically the first day when we, we thought, okay, this is kind of the visualizer. 
but it wasn't. Um, so we broke down the body of music. So if you see, we have stems here. What stems mean in, in music, they are uh, different lines of instru instrumentation in the music that are recorded and mixed and put together, and you hear the result. And that has its own space value. It has its own architecture and frequency if you analyze it. So imagine each one of these lines, one of them is bass, one of them is drum, or one of them is some synthesizer. So we t uh, separated these, we, we, we put them in um, solo, uh, in, in solo boxes, what, what I think of, actually, I name it solo boxes, and these solo boxes, they gave us data, data of those sounds. So, sounds turning into numbers, basically, a set of numbers, and they had different behaviors, frequency-wise. And now, we started designing um, objects for these sounds. Um, so the computer would take these numbers and give us a result based on, based on a process in, in, in a software. And it would give us different objects. So one of them was with the, uh, something similar to the tilt brush. And uh, the rest are Unreal game engine assets. So if you're familiar with game engines, you will, you will know that these are mostly um, things that you can see, and like shaders and so on. And this result to me was stunning, so it made me think this is, this is actually going to happen. This is turning music into a place, um, a building, I don't know, a, an environment, a landscape. Um, and by the way, just to add, when the music plays, these notes uh, show you a behavior. Either they move, they, they bounce, or they, they, uh, you see lights, and they kind of flash. Um, um, and so, yeah, this is another um, frame of that virtual reality experience. So then I had to realize what the timeline of the song is. For example, if, um, yeah, if the song starts from here, and we're moving that way, so here's 30 seconds of the song. So as the song reaches here, we can see things. So this would be one object in the music, that would be the bass, this would be um, the guitar, something here, this would be a noise just moving around. Um, so this unification of sound and visual, it was a stunning experience. Um, you can see the timeline of music. What I mean timeline is when you have this uh, duration of this, uh, a song, a piece of music, and then you move, you have a dynamic of behaviors like uh, frequency that is changing. And in visuals, I think that is possible too. So these two can unite and create an experience. Back to this. Um, so the, the interesting thing about this for me now is that this, this is not music anymore. This is not the medium as we knew it. The virtual reality is the environment which we, uh, we, we build that in virtual reality, of course. But this is something new. This is something um, of so, some sort of data experience. I call it data experience. Um, and I, I ask myself, what if music, if music is data, what if other things in the digital realm is data, and it can be something else. So this mix, we're going to talk about more later. Um, this is a 360 view of one of the scenes. And well, that's me. Also, um, added to this uh, audiovisual unification, we added SOPPAC, um, a device. It's a wearable technology that pulses sound through your body. So what it does, it takes sound, and without latency, it gives you some sort of touch. It behaves. It gives you in your back, and you feel sound in your body. So what, ha what is happening here now? So we have three sensories at work, audio, visual, and touch. So we, we have what we call the multi-sensory experience. And that's a live performance. We tested this in a live performance where I actually was in the virtual environment, and other people with headsets in, in another part of the world, they were using the, 
virtual reality headset. So it's interesting because now we talk about um, connecting, right? Um, th this to me is the ultimate way of connecting in a sense that if I can't go to a music venue, and probably I can't around the world every night, so I can be there at least experience 70% of the emotions that people get and share there and be represented by a visual, um, um, a visual asset or avatar of myself and they can see and interact. Okay. I hope you're not bored yet. <laughs> yeah. And this is uh, another experiment we did uh, having um, all these visual assets um, projected on a gauze, a black gauze, kind of invisible, where we, we, we kind of experiment, now what if those visuals were applied to me in real life? What would you see if I was here and there's some sort of animation on me that is kind of attached to me? So that was one of the experiences that we did in London. Um, so this, to me, in, uh, how I saw the audience react to this um, during those events was that people wanted to see more. It was, it was like it didn't finish there, unlike what I thought virtual reality would be. And Nathan mentioned augmented reality, we, like Pokemon Go. We, we just see it, and we don't want to see more because we experienced it. I think the approach is different. If we um, tackle the, the issues that are connected to human psychology, and um, they're connected to social political issues, um, we can actually build platforms that help. So because these platforms, they make us more curious, hence we are uh, more inclined to, to understand and learn more. So better cognition. So yeah, as, as I mean, two days of artificial intelligence, AR, we hear a lot about this stuff. Uh, especially VR and AR. Um, we're curious to know how we can add more to our visual experience of the world, which in my opinion, I mean, visuals, um, our vision is, is very important. And um, yeah, this, this, the stats show that everyone is moving towards augmented reality and virtual reality. So it's crazy. So that, that is actually dangerous. It's, not, it's good and it's bad um, because this could alter uh, the pathway of these technologies in a sense that it's business oriented uh, and, and people are not going to care much about uh, how this, this is going to actually help us. Um, yeah, you see how many, how many, how many brands, uh, media companies, they're investing in it. It's, it's just crazy. I mean, if, you, if you're familiar with stats, this is not something you see every day. Like in, in decades, you don't see this kind of uh, cramped um, race it's, it's really messy out there. So on the other hand, you remember that Commodore 64, uh, cute computer, useless? Um, it's turning into this. So quantum compu computation is coming. And they're testing D-Wave, and Google is testing it. A lot of deep, uh, deep learning companies are using this device. And what is interesting, I mean, it's a, it's a very interesting uh, era of com in, in computation, but I think there's a problem. Um, so if you see over time, computer performance will grow, even though it's, it has stopped now. I don't know if you know, but computer power is not changing. It's just the same thing. Um, but in theory, if we get there and we create uh, quantum computers, uh, Computer performance will surpass us, and human performance is going to just be dull exponentially. So, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> that was my uh, AI. He's not happy or she. Uh, <laughs> um, so, with DeepMind, in, uh, specifically DeepMind and, and other artificial intelligence projects, computer intelligence probably will surpass us. So we, we have to be ready for that anyway. This is, of course, I mean, up to debate if we see artificial in intelligence is going to uh, happen, actually, like the human-level AI is going to happen. There still is need for a miracle 
And we need a miracle. Oh my God, five minutes. Um, yeah, so I'll try to be faster. <clears throat> and this scenario is one of the many that people think it's going, this is going up to like Terminet, Skynet, come on. Um, I'm not saying it's not going to happen, but the most important thing about this is that we have to be uh, thinking about preventive measures. I mean, look at that guy. Um, so, yeah, I, I think we can all uh, see that how uh, our cognition depends on acceleration, uh, accelerating our cognition uh, in parallel with optimization of AI. So I think as, as much as we work and invest in artificial intelligence, we have to work and invest in our cognition and how we do th that. That's, that, is, that is the issue. How we can we accelerate human cognition evolution. Um, and I think we, one, of the, um, one of the main areas is to think how we can merge with computers. How we can catch up with, with those devices and use them and not see them as external devices, see them as uh, an extension to our cognition. Um, so if we go back, we, we used to, uh, as, as like early human beings, we used to take notes. Um, when we went hunting, we wanted to know how many animals we, we got into a fight with. We put like these symbols on the wall. And as um, David Chalmers and Andy Clark, they, they have this really, really great paper called The Extended Mind. And they, what they argue is that a node is an extension for the human mind. And, or an external part of the human brain. This is very important because if, if, if the node is an extension to the human mind, then it can be an external device for our brain. And obviously, what are nodes now? They're computers. They are um, our phones, our smart devices. So there's a story which I have to oh, make it really short. Uh, they, they, they make this example in the extended mind where two people are going to a museum. One of them has the uh, Alzheimer's disease and is using a note to remember the direction to the museum. The second person um, is mentally well uh, and remembers the directions using their brain. And what happens is that both of them succeed in finding the museum and go and get into the museum and experience the museum. But the argument here is very important because person A is using the node as an extension to the brain, which is doing the same thing, and person B is using their brain, and in, 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 uh, in principle, there's no difference between them. So th they both are using one data, one set of memory, one set of information that they have access to. So I'll... Yeah, so in a sense, uh, devices, these devices can extend our mind. We shouldn't see them as technologies that we add to our lives to have fun. These are actually extending our cognition. They're making us know more. So what if, by this ex extension, um, so what if the big questions of the universe um, are our main problems, actually? So we have like, big, big issues and big problems uh, in the universe. And what if we can actually use these devices instead of saying, OK, these are just passive technologies, and they're just going to come and go because some companies are profiting from it? What if actually they are, they're going to answer our bigger questions? Um, and what if we actually need to know more? Do I have extra time? This is bleak. Uh, yeah, try, uh, yeah, I was, I, I was going to say, uh, even though we're, we're going to uh, um, <laughs> improve our technology, still this is going to happen. And we have, um, p we have human beings with limited vision. And the absence of global knowledge will be the issue. And I'm hoping that we can um, resolve these problems with more optimization, and the use of technology, which is moving us towards a better world, and obviously the idea of merging with machines before we uh, hit the bottom. And thank you. On that note, I think I'm finished. <laughs> Thanks. In randomness, we trust.